It's the seventh annual event held across New York State uh, to raise awareness about invasive species. We're pleased to celebrate this year's theme, 2020 vision, focused on invasive species. Learning to identify priority species and reporting infestations early can help prevent them from becoming widespread. New York's forests, waterways, and agricultural lands are worth protecting. We thank you all for being here, and we invite you to stay active on invasive species issues by getting involved with APIP, a coordinated group of organizations and citizens working to prevent the spread of and manage invasive species in the Adirondacks. Following this event, please take a moment to complete the online feedback survey, which we'll provide a link for at the end of this presentation. To learn more about New York State's Invasive Species Awareness Week and see a list of all the events planned across New York State this week, please go to www.nyisaw.org. All right, so let's dive in. I like to start my presentation with a, a brief uh, overview of some terminology that we'll use throughout the uh, morning into the afternoon, uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page and speaking the same language. And again, if, if folks have questions, please feel free to enter them into the chat box um, throughout the presentation this morning. So first off, what are native species? What are non-natives? What are invasives? How do we distinguish the difference between these, these different terms? A native species is one that has been in our region for a long time. And typically we define a native as anything that has been here prior to or at the time of European settlement. Many of you may recognize the example on this slide. It is the trillium, pretty common wildflower that you'll find across New York State and in the Adirondacks blooms early in the spring, has nice beautiful foliage and, and uh, flowers. It's uh, beneficial for wildlife, it serves as a food source, so a lot of benefits uh, to the environment and to our ecosystem. It's a species that we'd like to see remain on the landscape for a long time into the future. A non-native species is one that has simply been introduced outside of its native historic range. Introductions could have been accidental or often they're purposeful as is the case for many ornamental or landscape species, like the one pictured here on the right-hand side of the slide. This is the California poppy, and as this name implies, it is native to the west coast of the United States. However, we have this plant here in New York. People plant it in their gardens and in their flower boxes, and it tends to keep to itself and not really cause any significant issues. And that is what will distinguish what is simply a non-native species from one that is invasive. So invasive species meet two criteria. If you remember one thing today, remember this. Invasive species are both non-native, so they've been introduced outside of their historic range, and they also cause some type of measurable harm to the environment, economy, or society and human health. The example listed here is a species that we'll learn about later on in the presentation. It is called Myla Minute. It's a non-native invasive vine that has been introduced to New York State, grows very quickly, outcompeting our native species and decreasing uh, diversity of plants in the ecosystem. But we'll learn more about that later on today. So with those definitions in mind, I always like to pose this question to folks just to kind of gauge um, you know, your, your thinking and um, opinions about plants in New York State. So I would, um, encourage folks to uh, take a guess and share your guess in the chat box of what percent of plant species in New York would simply be considered non-native. Take a wild guess and I'll give folks a few moments to enter their guesses into the chat box if you'd like. So I see we have a, a, guess, a couple of guesses coming in, 50%, 70%. Give folks just a couple more seconds if they wish to weigh in. 45, 30, great. So thank you all for that. So it is actually, um, it's 35%, or roughly one third of the plants in New York State would be considered non-native. So they're plants um, out of place. They've been brought from outside their historic native ranges. However, it's only a small percentage of those, maybe 10 to 15%, that are actually problematic or invasive and have negative <laughs> impacts. And those are the species we'll focus on and learn about today. So what is it that makes these species problematic or invasive? When we bring new plants or animals um, from outside the historic range, we often leave behind all of the predators, parasites, or pathogens that would normally keep their populations in check. 
In other words, in their non-native range, they're allowed to grow uncontrolled and become widespread very quickly, having a variety of different negative impacts. These non-native invasive species also will, will often have uh, certain traits or adaptations that allow them to be uh, extremely competitive in their new landscape. For example, many of these species will produce um, a high quantity of seed or offspring. This is the case for one of our uh, common invasive species here in the Adirondacks called purple loosestrife. This is a perennial wetland plant that is invasive, which can produce up to two million seeds in a single growing season. So tremendous uh, reproductive potential that allows it to outcompete some of our other native plants. Okay. Um... Many invasive species also reproduce early or often. Uh, this is an example of Japanese barberry that has invaded a forest understory. And what you'll notice is that uh, the Japanese barberry looks very leafed out, very green. It's actively growing where most of our other plants on the landscape have not even broken sen senescence um, in the spring. So by growing early, uh, these species are able to have a competitive advantage over our native plants. They're the first to use space, nutrients in the soil, water, um, and so on. So they just get a competitive jumpstart over some of our native species. Invasives are often generalists. They do not require nice, neat, manicured landscapes to grow in. Um, they'll often uh, put down roots wherever they can find some bare exposed soil. This is a perfect example of that. This is Japanese knotweed that you can see growing in a pretty rough environment here, right through the cracks in the concrete. So these species are able to take advantage of disturbance on the landscape and perhaps grow where, where other species would have a more difficult time establishing. And lastly, I'll mention that some species um, have what we would call allelopathy, or in other words, they exude certain types of chemicals from their plant parts, often their root system, that suppress the growth of other species around them. This is the case for one of our invasives, um, garlic mustard, which exudes a chemical from its root system that suppresses the growth of surrounding native species, allowing it to dominate forest understory landscapes. So we know what invasive species are, we know uh, some of the traits and adaptations that can make them invasive, but how do they get here and how are they spread? And unfortunately, the answer to that question is it's often us, it is people. Um, there are multiple pathways in which invasive species can be brought to new regions and spread, um, but most of them come back to human activities. So in the terrestrial invasive species world, some of the common vectors that we see within our region include the movement and use of contaminated fill, the use of invasive species in ornamental plantings and landscape, um, highway construction, uh, maintenance, um, movement of invasive species through terrestrial recreation activities on our boots, clothing, and equipment. And of course, we do have some natural pathways where invasive species can be spread through things like wi wildlife, wind, and water. But largely, invasive species are a human issue, which means that it is something we should be thinking about and that we have opportunity to address some of this spread through simple behavioral changes. So why should you care about invasive species? If you're tuning in today, I assume it, it is because that you have some interest in the natural world. You either like to spend time outside, perhaps you own property here in the Adirondacks. Regardless of your interests, um, invasive species affect us all. Uh, they're often referred to as bullies of the natural world in the sense that they take over our forests, our fields, our wetlands, and our properties. So if you enjoy spending time outside, it's likely that invasive species are impacting something that you care about. It could be that they make it more difficult for you to recreate. In the case of aquatic invasive species, they may clog our waterways, make it difficult to boat or fish. In the world of terrestrial invasives, uh, dense shrubs or viney uh, thorny vegetation may make it difficult to hike or hunt and, and recreate in the out, outdoors. And that can also damage uh, some of the native plants and wildlife that we care about, whether they be in natural settings or even in our uh, landscapes. They also hurt industry, uh, reducing agricultural commodity uh, production and industries like timber. And they can even hurt you. Um, there are certain species that have uh, damaging or harmful sap or they may increase the incidence of certain diseases on the landscape, such as Lyme disease. 
And of course we learn that many of these species are spread through our activities. So we should be thinking actively about how our actions um, can help prevent the spread of invasive species. So for example, if we're recreating out of doors, it's important to uh, clean your boots, clothing, equipment, and so on. So that provides us with a brief introduction to invasive species. Next, we'll transition into learning about some specific plants that are affecting um, the Adirondack region of New York State. This list of species was selected based on feedback from partners at APIP's um, April uh, Spring Partners meeting through a poll that we conducted um, at that time. And it includes a mixture of species that are both widespread within a region. In other words, you're likely to find them during your survey efforts, as well as some uh, less established species to give us a little bit of variation and mix. So before we move into this portion of the presentation, I'll take a brief pause to ask if we have any questions and folks can enter those into the chat box or um, can come off of mute. Okay, I'm not seeing anything or hearing anything, so we'll move on. And again, if, if questions arise, again, please feel free to plop them into that chat window. All right, so we'll start with our first species. This is a knotweed, a rhinutria. It is native to Asia and was introduced to the United States in the 1800s. There are actually multiple species of invasive knotweed present in New York State, which we lump into this uh, general category of, of just invasive knotweed. Those individual species include Japanese knotweed, giant knotweed, and a hybrid of the two referred to as Bohemian knotweed. Luckily for us, they all look very similar, so they're pretty easy to identify. And we manage them using similar techniques, so it's not necessarily important um, to distinguish them to the species level. Um, they invade open and disturbed sites, such as roadsides, stream corridors, forest edges, and fields. This assemblage of knotweed species is very difficult to remove once established due to their extensive network of underground roots. So it's important if we want to manage the species that we identify them very early. They have many negative impacts to the environment. They can increase erosion when established along stream banks because the species is not very deeply rooted and does not hold soil in place very well. They grow in very dense stands that can limit recreational access and can even reduce property values. And just to address a quick question in the chat, yes, these slides will be available later on. So how do we identify the knotweed species? They're a large herbaceous shrub at full growth, they can reach 12 or 15 feet in height and occur in very dense stands. It's a pretty difficult species to miss at peak growth. The leaves of knotweed are often described as roughly heart-shaped, given that they have a slight indentation towards the base and come to a fine tip or point. And the branches of knotweed are unique in the sense that if you view them from above or below, they'll often have this zigzag pattern. So kind of a, a interesting appearance. Knotweed is sometimes referred to as uh, Japanese bamboo, although it is not a true bamboo species, it is in a different genus. However, it does closely resemble bamboo given its cane-like stems. So the stems of knotweed are hollow, they are green in color, and they will often be covered with small red spots or blotches and about every foot along the stem, there will be a little raised ridge or node that really gives it this bamboo-like appearance. The stems of knotweed may often be covered with a white waxy uh, substance that is easily rubbed off with your finger. And these canes or stems can vary significantly in size. They may be as big around as your pinky or can be several inches in diameter if mature and well-established. Knotweed flowers in the late summer, we typically see blooms start to appear in late August into September, and they occur as large clusters of small white flowers towards the ends of the branches. Knotweed will produce some viable seed, however, its primary spread mechanism is through uh, vegetative expansion with an extensive underground root system that can sometimes extend 50 or 60 feet horizontally from where you're seeing plants um, growing above ground. 
This species can spread by fragmentation. So if the stems or roots are broken apart, for example, by mowing, each fragment that is generated may reroot and grow into a new plant. This species is especially problematic when it occurs along river corridors because high water events and floods can break apart those above ground stems and carry them downstream, creating these large linear monocultures. Japanese knotweed's root system is incredibly um, durable and it can grow through three inches of asphalt or concrete and has been known to penetrate building foundations, sidewalks, and driveways, so having infrastructure impacts. This is a distribution map showing the abundance of knotweed across northern New York. You can see our prism in the northeastern corner there. Um, these orange circles represent the abundance of knotweed. The larger the circle, the more points or um, infestations have been recorded in that area. So you can see it's widely distributed across our landscape. And it's one that you're, you'll likely encounter um, during your survey efforts. It's often found along roadsides, um, residential areas, or, or really anywhere with human disturbance. Someone asked the question if this is the species that looks like bamboo, and uh, that, that is, yes, it does, although it is not a true bamboo species. Next, we'll discuss oriental bittersweet, so changing from an herbaceous plant to a woody. This is also native to Asia and it was introduced again in the 1800s. It prefers open sites where it can get a lot of sun, such as roadsides, forest edges, and fields. It has multiple spread mechanisms, including bird dispersed berries. And it can form large, dense mats that shade out our native plants. And its climbing vines may girdle and kill trees. This species is also known to hybridize with our Native American bittersweet, which is considered a rare plant in New York so it can have impacts to the genetics of that um, desirable native species. Oriental bittersweet is a climbing woody vine that forms large, uh, dense mats of vegetation. It will reach, on, reach out and grab onto uh, different types of substrate in order to reach up into the canopy for more sunlight. It may climb trees, power poles, fences, or really any type of, of infrastructure or other plants that may be present on the landscape. The leaves of oriental bittersweet are arranged alternately on the stem, as you can see in this photo. So they're not directly across from one another, but rather arranged alternately. The leaves themselves are elliptical or circular in shape, typically light green in color, and about two to five inches long with a serrated or toothed edge. As I mentioned, oriental bittersweet is a climbing vine. It is woody, and the size of the vines can vary significantly depending on the age of the plant. Um, they may be as you know, small as the diameter of a pencil as the vine is becoming established, and when they get more mature, they may, re may reach four or six or even more uh, inches in diameter. So it can be a pretty robust plant. Oriental bittersweet is dispersed primarily by a berry that is carried by birds. When immature and developing, the berry will be green in color, small and round. And as it matures into late summer, it will turn a bright orange color and those orange husks or kind of shell will open up revealing a bright red berry. These will often remain persistent on the vine through the winter or at least into the fall. It may even be found the following growing season. So again, oriental bittersweet creates large, dense mats that shade out vegetation beneath, reducing uh, diversity in uh, forest edges and fields. And as you can see in the lower left, as these vines climb up host species, often trees, they can constrict around their host so tightly that they actually girdle and kill mature trees. So it can have impacts to our forests and uh, their commercial value either for timber um, in a maple sugar stand or just ecological value. This is again a map showing the distribution of oriental bittersweet across northern New York. 
This is a species that I would consider to be underreported. We know anecdotally that this is a relatively widespread um, species on the landscape, particularly in the eastern portion of our region around Lake George and uh, going north towards Lake Champlain. So this is a species where we could really use your assistance learning more about where it's located. If you see this species on the landscape, it, it would be really valuable for you to report it um, via IMAP invasives. And we'll learn all about how to do that this afternoon. Next, we'll talk about bush honeysuckle. This is a species that is native to Eurasia and was introduced to the US in the 1800s as an ornamental plant and for um, wildlife uh, forage, essentially. Much like knotweed, there are multiple species of honeysuckle present in New York State, which we generally lump into this broad category of invasive bush honeysuckles. It includes species like tartarian, amur, bells, and moros. Um, and there are actually a few more out there. It loves sunlight, so it will invade fields, forest edges, um, but it can also tolerate quite a bit of shade, so you'll often see it pushing its way into shaded forest understories. So it's pretty adaptable in where it will grow. It does prefer drier soil, but can tolerate some degrees of, of dampness. This also has multiple spread mechanisms, including bird dispersed berries. Shrubs can grow in dense stands that shade out our native plants and even re inhibit tree regeneration. And this is a species that when found in large abundance may increase the incidence or uh, quantity of ticks on the landscape given its dense growth habit and the, and the cover that it provides to small mammals. So bush honeysuckle is a deciduous woody shrub that can grow up to 20 or 25 feet in height. It may appear very multi-stemmed in a shrub-like um, appearance like what you see here or it may become single stemmed and appear more like a small tree, depending on its, its location where it's growing. The leaves are simple. They're located oppositely on the stem, are light green in color with smooth edges or margins. So pretty plain looking leaf. The stems of bush honeysuckle are woody and they are hollow. This is a unique characteristic that can be used to distinguish invasive bush honeysuckles from their native lookalikes. We do have a native honeysuckle species on the landscape. However, that species will have a solid center in its stem. So if you find a bush honeysuckle and you're unsure if it is native or invasive, it can be helpful to take a clipping of the stem, which can be used to determine you know, if it's invasive or native. If it's, ho if it's hollow, that's an indicator that this is the invasive species. If it is solid, that will indicate that this could be a native species. Bush honeysuckle produces an abundance of fragrant flowers early in the summer. This species is likely in full bloom across most of the Adirondacks, and the flowers can be pink, yellow, or even a pink or orange in color. So they're pretty variable depending on the species. These fragrant flowers will give rise to soft, fleshy berries that may be bright red or bright orange in color. And these are readily consumed by birds, which serve as one of the primary spread vectors for this species. Again, this is a map showing the distribution of the bush honeysuckle species across New York. This again, I would consider to be an underreported species. This is probably one of the most prevalent that you'll encounter um, during your survey efforts. It can be found in most locations throughout the region. So again, as you encounter it, definitely report it. We can't get enough um, data for this species. Next, I'll talk about the buckthorn species. We have two here in, in the Adirondack region, common and glossy buckthorn. They're native to, native to parts of Europe and Asia and were introduced to the US in the 1800s. Much like, like bush honeysuckle, these species prefer disturbed and open sites where they can get some sunlight, such as roadsides and field edges, forest edges. They can also tolerate some shade and will occasionally or frequently make their way into the forest understory and they are spread easily by their bird dispersed berries. Dense thickets of buckthorn eliminate native species and can limit recreational access. Although the berries are readily consumed by birds, they're actually toxic to wildlife and can cause certain species um, intestinal distress. 
So I'll talk about the two species of, of buckthorn sort of together and separately. They're both very similar in growth habit. The photo that you're looking at here is of common buckthorn. However, they will both look very similar when you find them growing in the, in the, in the wild. They are perennial shrubs that are deciduous. They will often take on the appearance of a shrub in the understory. And as they may become more mature, may become may start to resemble more of a small tree and become single stemmed. They can reach up to 30 feet in height when mature and may develop a trunk that is up to 10 inches in diameter. Common buckthorn is more likely to be found growing in areas with dry soil where glossy buckthorn prefers a moister habitat and is often an invader of wetlands. Leaves can be used to distinguish the difference between these two buckthorn species. On the left, we have common buckthorn. The leaves are referred to as sub-opposite. So you can see that they're, they're almost directly across, across from one another, but they're actually offset just a tiny bit. The leaves themselves are dark green in color for, for common buckthorn, and they will have a finely serrated or toothed edge. And one of the other unique characteristics of the buckthorns are their arching veins on the leaf. So you can see on common buckthorn, it has these pairs of arching veins. And for common buckthorn, you'll typically see three to five pairs of these arching veins. Now we compare that to glossy buckthorn, and what we'll notice is that for glossy, the leaves are once again um, sub-opposite or even alternate. In this case, the um, leaves will also be dark dark green in color. They'll often have a glossier appearance, as their name implies. The edges, however, will be smooth. So this is a difference from common buckthorn. Common is toothed, glossy is smooth. And when we look at those arching veins, we'll notice that glossy buckthorn will have many more pairs. So sometimes eight or nine pairs of those arching veins, where common will only have three to five. So that's one way to distinguish the difference between these two species. They will both have similar bark. It is usually a gray brown color and will be covered with these interesting, uh, what we call lenticels, or kind of horizontal stripes or almost look like little scars. There are a few clues that we can use to distinguish the species by their stems and twigs. So in the case of common buckthorn, it will often be covered with these um, armored kind of thorns. These can be located along the main stem and each branch will typically have a small spike um, at, the, at the apex or the end of the branch. Glossy buckthorn will not have those terminal spines or spines located along its main stem. Also, if we were to take a small peeling of the bark, the interior of common buckthorn will have this orange color or appearance, where if we peel the way the bark of glossy buckthorn, it would not be orange and rather just a white color. Both buckthorn species produce fleshy berries towards the middle or end of summer. They are round in color, and for common buckthorn, they are typically black. In the glossy buckthorn, we can see some greater variation in the color of the berries, where they may be a mixture of reddish brown or that darker black. And both of these species invade forest understories um, and edges, where they can form dense monocultures that exclude native plants and wildlife and make recreation difficult given their thick, thorny uh, structure. Again, here is their distribution in northern New York. I would also consider this species underreported, and we would appreciate your assistance in helping fill some of these data gaps. The buckthorns are particularly prevalent in the eastern portion of our prism. You can see there's a fair amount of data for them up here in the northeast near Lake Champlain, but their distribution does extend south um, to the southern reaches of Lake Champlain and northern Lake George. Okay, now we're starting to transition to some of our um, uh, less, lesser distributed species. So these are a little bit less common in our region. Swallowwort um, is a primary, one of the primary focuses for our early detection and rapid response team. And is a species that we're treating aggressively across uh, a large portion of our prism to keep out of the interior Adirondacks. So any reports that we receive for this species are, are not taken lightly and uh, we appreciate all of the survey effort that folks can put into this particular plant. 
The swallowworts are native to Europe and they were introduced to the U.S. in the 1800s. There are two species present in the Adirondacks that we'll discuss, and those are black and pale swallowworts. These are sun-loving species, so you'll often find them in fields and along roadsides. They can tolerate some degree of shade and we'll occasionally see them reaching into the forest understory. They have a light wind dispersed seed that makes them a very efficient self disperser. They form dense mats of vegetation that exclude other native plants and they have foliage that is toxic to monarch butterfly larvae. This species is a sprawling or crawling um, climbing herbaceous vine that can reach uh, lengths of up to seven, maybe 10 feet. It will grow along the kind of floor of a field or forest if it has no substrate or um, host to attach to. But if it, if it finds a tree or a shrub or a power pole, it will grow upwards into the canopy. The leaves of swallowwort are located oppositely on the stem, so directly across from one another. They are a dark green a color and they are quite glossy. When I'm serving for swallowwort, it is often the green, dark green glossy foliage that catches my eye and kind of cues me into this species. The flowers can sometimes be used to distinguish the difference between the two swallowwort species that we have here in New York. This species will bloom and begin to produce its flowers usually in mid-July, or excuse me, mid-June, and they will persist into early July. Located on the left-hand side of the slide here is the flower of black swallowwort. To provide a sense of scale, both of these flowers are smaller than a dime, so they're, they're pretty small. Black swallowwort is a deep purple or black color, and the leaf petals are typically described as being about as long as they are wide at the base and there'll be a five petaled flower. Pale swallowwort is often this light pink or even close to a white. The petals are about twice as long as they are wide at the base and they're also five petaled. So again, these flowers will be present usually from mid-June into early parts of July. Swallowwort was once um, classified or uh, as part of the milkweed family, although its taxonomy has changed. It does have a very milkweed-like seed pod that is fleshy, usually about three and a half to four inches in length. And they are green in color. These will begin to develop usually in mid-July. And towards the tail end of, the Ju of July, these will begin to turn brown and dry out and open up, revealing light tufted seeds. You can see a couple of these seeds here in the background. So if you're familiar with common milkweed, the seeds of swallowed are very similar. So when these seed pods open up, those light seeds are dispersed pretty significant distances by wind, sometimes up to a quarter mile. So again, this is a sprawling climbing mat, forms dense uh, mats of vegetation that smother out our other native plant species. And given that it is a very close, has a very close relationship to common milkweed, which is the host species for our monarch butterflies, those monarchs will unfortunately often lay their larvae onto swallowwort. Unfortunately, uh, when those larvae or their, their eggs hatch, the larvae are unable to feed successfully on the species. And if they do eat it, it is often toxic and, and will kill them. So this is a, unfortunately another factor that is impacting our imperiled monarch butterflies. In terms of its distribution across our region, uh, luckily it is uh, not widespread across the whole Adirondack region. It is most likely to be encountered in the Lake George or Lake Champlain uh, valleys, so on the eastern portion of our prism. It is often, it is also quite prevalent in the northern portion of our county, although underreported. So north of the Adirondack Park boundary and south of New York's border with Canada, you're likely to find it up here. And we have some outliers in the south, southwestern portion of our, of our prism. So again, this is a species that our staff and response team work actively to exclude or contain, um, to prevent from uh, invading the interior of the Adirondacks. So any reports that you provide are, are taken very seriously. This next species is an interesting one in the sense that it is still sold and used as an ornamental species in New York State. 
Japanese tree lilac is native to parts of China and Japan. And again, it, is, it has been widely used as an ornamental species, but is beginning to demonstrate invasive tendencies along rivers and in floodplains. And we definitely think that it is underreported in the Adirondack prism, given that it is um, you know, just starting to kind of emerge as an invasive species. So we're really interested in learning more about where this tree occurs across our region. We've seen it um, acting very invasively along portions of the Osable River, and it is known to create monocultures that shade out other understory species and um, exclude other trees. So what does it look like? It is a medium-sized deciduous tree, um, often used in ornamental because of its nice uh, growth form, this kind of globe shape. It will typically occupy the mid-story. It is about 25 feet in height, but can become pretty robust. Um, they are covered with a uh, large number of blooms. Usually these will begin to appear towards the end of June. If you are uh, an Adirondack resident and live near the Tri Lakes region, uh, this, may this photo may be familiar to you. This is actually taken at the, the Lake Placid Horseshoe grounds. So if you're ever traveling through Lake Placid region um, towards the end of June, keep your eyes out for this, this plant. This is a great example that you can use to learn how to identify this species. Its leaves closely resemble that of our um, you know, common ornamental lilac shrubs. They are simple and occur in pairs along the stem. They're oval in shape with a rounded base and a pointed tip and will have smooth edges. The bark of Japanese tree lilac is typically a reddish brown in color. If you're familiar with cherry trees, it does have a cherry-like appearance in that it will also have these little openings or you may view them as scars called lenticels along the, um, the length of the stem. And as we saw in that opening photo, this, this tree species produces numerous blooms of small creamy white flowers. These are very fragrant, just like our common uh, shrub lilac. The, the flowers are typically six to 12 inches in length and will be very dominant on the trees, usually towards the tail end of June into July, depending on where, they, where they're growing. Those flowers will give rise to a large number of seeds that are these small capsules that will uh, remain persistent on the plant often throughout the whole winter into the following growing season. And this is one of the primary spread mechanisms for this species and the way it's able to escape into natural areas. The seeds can be spread by both wind and water. Here is the current distribution uh, as reported of Japanese tree lilac within our region. It is likely a very underreported species given its prevalence as an ornamental and landscape plant. So again, we're very interested in learning more about where the species occurs across our prism. The next species on our list is mile a minute. And now we're transitioning again to a species that is even less distributed or less common in our region. This is targeted for eradication at the prism scale. Mile a minute is native to Asia. It was introduced to the US in the 1930s and, disturb, and invades disturbed open sites. It really likes sunlight. It's most likely to occur in sunny areas and not really in the shade. So we'll see it along forest edges, roadsides, and fields. It has uh, several spread mechanisms, including bird dispersed berries. As its name implies, it is a very fast growing species. It can put on up to six inches of growth in a day, allowing it to quickly shade out and smother native plants. The stems are covered in numerous sharp recurved spines that uh, make it very unpleasant to walk through and it can be a deterrent to recreation where it, incur where it occurs in high abundance. So again, mile minute is an herbaceous vine that uh, will climb up over really anything that it can grab onto, whether it be other vegetation, uh, a car, uh, debris in your guard. It uh, is pretty, it does not discriminate. Leaves are very unique. They're pretty easy to identify. They are triangular in shape and almost resemble an arrowhead with a little bit of an indent towards the base and they will have a smooth edge. You can see in this photo, the stems 
covered in their numerous small recurved spines. It makes it a real treat if you're trying to uh, manage this species mechanically. Myelominate has a secondary leaf structure known as a ocrae that looks like a circular leaf that completely encapsulates the stem. It's as if someone took the stem and stabbed it through the center of this leaf. So a very unique feature. And myelominate will produce a small hard berry that is green in color when immature and as it ripens will turn a uh, blue or purple color. Berries on this species occur pretty early in the growing season, even here in the Adirondacks. We'll see these propagules begin to appear as early as uh, the beginning of June in some regions. So this is a species that we try to find very early in the growing season so we can respond to it and, can, and perform management before it's able to, to produce these propagules. So a very fast growing species that creates dense mats that shade out our native vegetation and can inhibit recreational activities. A very high priority for our program and for the region, given that it only, there's only one known occurrence within the Adirondack prism. This species was detected for the first time in our region last year in Clinton County near Plattsburgh, and this is currently the only known occurrence within all of the Adirondack Park. Um, unfortunately, it's likely that this species occurs somewhere else and that we just have not found it yet. So um, we, we look to our volunteers and partners to help us fill data gaps and, and locate this species wherever it may occur. Given that it is bird dispersed, it's very unlikely that it made this significant jump from you know, uh, Troy area all the way up to Plattsburgh without occurring somewhere in between. So a great one to keep your eyes out for as you're recreating early in the summer months. Next, we'll talk about Tree of Heaven, another species that is in low uh, abundance throughout our prism and is targeted for eradication. This species is native to Asia and was introduced to the US in the late 1700s and early 1800s. It is a sun-loving deciduous tree that'll occur in open sites, forest edges and roadsides and waste areas. It is not really known to push its way back into the interior of a natural kind of forest. It is most often associated with edge habitats. This species serves as a host for the invasive spotted and lanternfly, which we'll learn about later on in our presentation. It's very highly competitive in disturbed sites. It is allelopathic and exudes chemicals that suppresses the growth of other species. And where it occurs along roadsides, given its uh, fast growth habit and ability to produce a lot of uh, small sprouts, it can damage infrastructure or be a maintenance issue for highway crews and that it impedes line of sight along roadways. So Tree of Heaven is an herbaceous, or excuse me, a deciduous tree. It is rapidly growing and it is known to reach heights of up to 80 feet in certain areas. However, we have never seen it occur that large here in the Adirondacks. The few infestations that we're aware of have typically been on average about 20 to 40 feet in height. So pretty uh, uh, moderately sized, I would say. And this species has pretty unique leaves. They're a large compound leaf that can be made up with, that can have up to 10 or 40, up to 41 of these leaflets. These leaves themselves can be up to three feet in length and the leaflets will have a smooth edge. A Couple other unique characteristics, while the leaves will have a smooth edge, they will ha also have these little bumps towards the base of the leaf known as glandular teeth. So you can see these little bumps. This is a unique feature for Tree of Heaven. Also, if um, you know, the compound leaf with the many leaflets, smooth edges and glandular teeth is not enough to help you identify this species, you can pluck one of these leaves off and crush it between your fingers and, and give it a little smell. This species has a very unpleasant aroma that is often described as burnt peanut butter or cat urine. So not a very pleasant species. Um, and it's a, it's a real wonder why it was ever used ornamentally. This species produces primarily um, by seed. So in midsummer, it will produce these large blooms of small white flowers at the um, top of the tree at ends of the branches, which will then give rise to red single-winged samaras, or this is the fruit that uh, allows Tree of Heaven to spread. They're often dispersed by wind or water. 
It takes several years for a tree to uh, reach reproductive maturity. And thankfully, all of the individuals that we found here in the Adirondacks had not reached this point. So that means we have a very good opportunity to contain this species and hopefully eradicate it from our region. It is only known to occur in a couple locations within the Adirondacks down in the southeastern corner around Lake George. Uh, you can see a couple of those infestations here. Um, one of these, one of three is currently under active management and it is our intent to control any site that we find within our region. Okay, moving away from the plant world, we'll talk about one pest uh, today. This is a species that is not known to occur in the Adirondacks or even in New York State. The spotted lanternfly is native to China, India, and Vietnam, and it was first found in the United States in Pennsylvania in 2014. Um, individual sightings have occurred in New York State, but it is not known to be established or have uh, you know, reproducing populations. This species damages both trees and agricultural commodities and is known to feed on over 70 different host species. As the insects feed on, it, on its host, it, re, it excretes a honeydew that can damage crops and lead to the development of sooty mold. This species reproduces rapidly and forms large swarms that hinder outdoor activities and can impact quality of life. This species has several uh, stages in its development, beginning as an egg that hatches into a nymph progresses through four different instars, getting progressively larger as it develops. It will then um, transition into an adult uh, winged insect that can disperse pretty uh, efficiently on its own. So what do these different stages look like? The first three stages um, of the nymphal life form are black in color with white spots. The first nymphal instar may only be a quarter inch long and is sometimes mistaken uh, for ticks. As it progresses into its second and third instar, those nymphs will get slightly larger. Um, and then finally, in the fourth instar, the, the nymph will develop some red coloration on its body. At this point, it will be about three quarters of an inch long. It will then molt into an adult insect, which is pictured here in the two right-hand photos. The adult is about one inch long and one half inch wide at rest. Many of the photos that you'll see of spotted lanternfly, picture it in this uh, state here on the right with its wings expanded. Uh, it is very colorful in this stage. However, it's important to note that this insect is actually a leaf hopper. Um, so it will only be in this appearance with the wings open if it is in flight or about to take flight. It's much more likely that you'll see it in its state at rest featured here um, kind of in the center photograph. So you might not see these bright red um, um, hind wings when it's at rest. In addition to looking for the insects themselves, you can look for signs of an insect infestation. This is a, um, a leaf hopper and it has a piercing sucking mouth part that it uses to feed on um, the kind of nutrients within its host species. As that feeding occurs, it may cause the host to begin to ooze sap from its trunks or branches, giving the host a wet appearance. As the insect is feeding, it produces um, a secretion known as honeydew, which can build up underneath the plants and sometimes develop a black sooty mold, which is what's featured here in the center photograph. This species has a wide range of hosts. When it was first discovered, it was believed that its um, only host was Tree of Heaven. However, they're finding that this species is more and more adaptable and will feed on a variety of different species. Um, the early instar nymphs are particularly, um, have a particularly broad range of host species. And they're finding that as the insect matures, it begins to develop more um, specificity towards certain host species like Tree of Heaven. This is an insect that is of great um, concern to uh, state agencies here in New York State, including both DEC and the Department of Ag and Markets. So in addition to reporting this using IMAP invasives, as we'll, learning about, as we'll learn about later on today, you can also report spotted lanternfly sightings to this email address at the bottom of your slide. 
spider lanternfly is primarily spread through its eggs. So the adult insects will lay their eggs really on any surface that they can find. Uh, maybe a tree, or it could be an RV, a vehicle, uh, lawn chairs, really anything. And unfortunately, that's one of the ways that this species is so is able to disperse so easily. Um, the adults will lay their eggs on you know, our equipment, our vehicles, and as we move those equipment and vehicles, we unknowingly move these egg masses with them. So transportation by human activities is, is the most common spread vector for this species. And as we mentioned, it's very damaging to both trees and agricultural commodities. It's known to impact things like grapes and hops. These uh, insects become very, very abundant, as you can see in this photograph, where they feed on the branches, uh, lead to the excretion of that honeydew, which covers the crops, really damaging them and making them um, unsuitable for um, sale. And they it can cause the development of that black sooty mold. Here's the current distribution of spotted lantern fly um, in, on the, in the Northeast. You can see its, um, its epicenter where it was originally found in Berks County, Pennsylvania, and it has radiated out from there, now occupying or being, becoming established in four different states. These pink dots represent individual sightings that have occurred in New York State. However, it is not believed that there are any established infestations of this species in New York. However, it is an a, a important target for early detection efforts, so a great one to keep your eyes out for as you're recreating this summer. All right, so that was the last of our 10 species. At this point, I would ask if there are any questions and you can enter those into the chat box or you may unmute yourself and, and ask the question directly. I'll give folks a few minutes to do that. Um, someone asked if there will be a webinar on aquatic invasives, and the answer to that is, is absolutely yes. Um, tomorrow we will actually have a very similar training focused on aquatic invasive species led by our um, aquatic invasive species coordinator, Aaron Venny Volrath. That will also be from 10 to 12, and you can find details for that on our webpage. Yeah, so someone asked a question about false spirea. Um, that is a, is a species that we do have here in the Adirondacks. Um, I didn't include it in our presentation today. Um, I wish we had more time to talk about a whole suite of different plants, but um, yeah, that's one I did not cover. Um, it is kind of in the same ballpark as Japanese tree lilac, where it is still, I believe, used as an ornamental species, and we're seeing it begin to act pretty invasively in certain areas. So if you're familiar with that species, please do report it to us. It can help inform our knowledge of where it occurs and help us develop uh, management strategy, strategies if we think that that's necessary. Someone asked, how do we make sure we're not inadvertently buying invasive species from a garden center? And that is a great question. So here in New York State, um, we have what is called the Invasive Species Prevention Act which was put into effect back in 2014. So this um, series of regulations actually prohibits the sale of most invasive species in New York State. You can access a full list of the species that are included in these regulations from the DEC. Uh, it is um, in short often referred to as the Part 575 regulations. So you'll be able to see a list of all the species that are no longer available for sale these are uh, described as prohibited species, but there are also what we call regulated species um, that are still being available, are still being offered for sale, but folks are encouraged to seek native alternatives or make sure they're not introducing those species into a free living state. So I would encourage you to learn about what those regulated species are, and really the best thing that you can do is avoid using them. There are um, some other emerging species that are not included in these regulations yet. And uh, you know the best way to kind of stay up to date with that, I would say, is to um, uh, you know just stay in touch with your prism. That's that's some of the things that we try to look at are new and emerging species. And if there's something that is of concern to you, maybe you have a plant in your garden that's acting aggressively, um, let someone know. Reach out to us, and we're happy to help um, you know 
help you figure out if that's something that you should be concerned about. Someone asked if there's a book or pamphlet that can be used to identify these species. Um, there are several different field guides available and we can um, try to share some of that information following the presentation. If you also visit our website, um, www.adkinvasives.com, we have profiles that can be used to learn more about all of the species we shared today. Okay, at this point it is um, just about, or it is 11 o'clock, so we're halfway through our training. We're right on track. I would now um, say that folks can take a break, get up and stretch your, leg, stretch your legs, grab a snack or water if you need it, and we'll resume in 10 minutes. The second half of our presentation will focus on using the IMAP Invasives mobile app to report observations of invasive species. So if you're interested in learning about that, I would encourage you to make sure that that app is currently downloaded to your mobile device. If it is not, this is a great opportunity to download it and create your account. And to someone, someone asked if this will be available as a video. Um, yes, it will. We are recording this, this presentation. So if folks want to take a break, we'll resume at 11.10 a.m. All right, everyone, welcome back. It's 11.10, so we're going to get started to make sure that we can end on time at um, 12 o'clock. So the next section of the presentation or training will be focused on surveying and reporting using the IMAP Invasives mobile tool. So again, this is a training that is normally held in person, so we're adapting to a new format here. So I'll ask that folks please be patient with us as we help you work through the use of the mobile app. Um, it's a little bit more difficult not being able to provide one-on-one -on -one assistance, but we'll, we'll do the best that we can. So where and when should we look for these invasive species that we just learned about? Um, we learned about 10 different species and um, the answer is pretty simple. It's anytime and anywhere. So invasive species are most likely to be found in disturbed areas. So roadsides, trailheads, campgrounds, residential areas. So as you're out recreating, social distancing this summer, um, keep your eyes out for invasive species in some of these areas and report what you find or what you don't find. Um, presence and absence data is important to us to help inform the invasive species survey and management efforts that our staff and contractors do on the ground. So we can help keep track of invasive species distribution in New York using our invasive species distribution database called IMAP Invasives. This is a program hosted by the New York Natural Heritage Program in collaboration with um, DEC. It includes a suite of reporting tools, um, both mobile and desktop, that allows both practitioners and citizen scientists to track the distribution of invasive species across New York, monitor control efforts, and learn more about um, some of these species abundance in the state. If you're a practitioner or just an interested citizen scientist, you can also sign up for email alerts using this system to learn about when new um, observations are recorded in different parts of the state. And I've, I've included the URL to the webpage at the bottom of this slide. This is just a preview of what the um, web interface looks like. It is a map based system that allows you to view the distribution of certain species as well as record um, observations. So I would, I would encourage folks to explore this um, on their own time after the training. The IMAP system allows us to collect mul multiple types of data, um, including a searched area, which basically documents where we looked for certain species. If we found something, we can record presence data in the form of a point, a line, or a polygon. And we can also capture information about what we did not find. So if we were looking for a particular species and didn't find it in that area, we can document that using this system. If you're a practitioner or a landowner and you're managing species, you can also capture all of your treatment information using the database. It includes tools to interact um, both on mobile in the field and um, on desktop um, in your office or in your home. The mobile app, which we'll learn about today, is for collecting simple data. So basically, did you find the species or did you not find it? Um, you can also access the whole database on mobile if you have connectivity or using your desktop or laptop computer. 
Today we'll focus on the mobile application, just given how, how uh, much more simple it is to use and a little bit easier to interact with in this virtual training format. So um, at this point, we're going to, I'm going to ask that all participants that are interested in using and learning about the app um, get their mobile device handy in front of them. The IMAP mobile app is um, able to be used on both uh, Apple and Android devices. It can be used on a phone or a tablet that has location or GPS, uh, avail uh, GPS available. So our goal for today, for the remainder of this training, is to learn how to use the app to record an observation of an invasive species so that you can all keep your eyes out for and report observations of the species that we learned about earlier on in this presentation. So our goal for today is we're going to log into the app, we're going to set our preferences, and we're going to add and upload an observation for fake species. So this will be a little interesting as we work through this digitally. If you encounter issues or questions, you can enter them in the chat box and we'll try to address them as they um, arise. If you really get stuck and you can't keep up, um, I will offer the opportunity for one-on-one -on -one technical assistance if you remain on the line at the end of today's call. So let's get started. If you have your mobile device in front of you, um, I would ask that you open up the IMAP mobile app. And I'll try to give folks enough time to, to follow along here. So when you open up the map, or I'm sorry, the app, you're presented with this home screen. You have a couple of uh, buttons here. On the top right, you have the option to add an observation. And on the top left, you should see three white horizontal lines, which represent the menu. So if you tap the menu button, it should bring up this window. And I'll ask that you all um, select preferences from the bottom or near the bottom of this list. So here is where we will um, identify or fill out all of our user settings. So first and foremost, if you um, have already used the IMAP app, you don't need to you know, proceed through these steps. This is only for new, us new users. So if you're new to the app, um, you know, please follow through with these, these next couple steps. So the first thing that we'll wanna do is set our jurisdiction. If you are a New York resident and tuning in from, from New York today, we'll set our jurisdiction to New York. So there's a drop down menu that you can use to select New York State. Someone asked where they get the app, and they can get the app for free um, in the App Store if you're an Apple user, or in the Google Play Store if you're an Android user. Once you've identified your jurisdiction as New York, I would next ask that folks populate their IMAP username and password. This is what you would use to log into the IMAP Invasives online database. If you already have a username and password, you can enter it here. If you have never used IMAP before and do not have an account, you can click that um, blue hyperlink that will give you the option to create an account. Your IMAP Invasives username is your email address and your password is the same that you would use to log into the online interface. If you had an existing IMAP account, but you have not used it in a long time, since uh, April 2019, you'll need to reset your password. Um, and you can reset your password using the blue hyperlink here. So I'll give folks just another minute to set their jurisdiction and enter their username and password. And if you have issues, you can let us know in the chat box. So I'll give folks an, uh, another 45 seconds or so to fill out those fields.
Okay, so next, after you filled out your jurisdiction and IMAP username and password, I would ask that you select the green button that says retrieve IMAP lists. This will help make sure that your app is up to date with the most recent species list that is available. When you tap the retrieve IMAP lists button, it will kind of show you that it's processing and then will notify you when it's complete. It should only take a few seconds. So everyone should have completed these five steps at this point. Ooh, great question. So someone asked if you can do multiple jurisdictions. And I believe at this point, if you wanted to do that, you'll have to um, you know, go back into the preferences and kind of hop back and forth as you move between those, those different jurisdictions. That's a great question. Okay, so next we're gonna, we're gonna keep scrolling down you should have an option where you can display species names either scientifically or using the common name. So you can toggle on, excuse me, one or even both of those options. Um, as you toggle them on, they will turn blue. Um, I like to use the common names. There's next a button for you where you can create a custom species list. Um, this is not something that we'll do right now because it takes a, a little bit of time. So just for efficiency, I'll ask that folks complete this later on. Uh, but the custom species list can be used to filter down the available species that will appear in IMAP to only those that you are familiar with. So it can make it a little bit easier and more efficient to collect data in the field. Um, so if you're interested in, in creating a custom species list, I would encourage you to, um, to do that after the training. We will next select the picture quality. Um, so this is essentially how large and how clear the photo will be uh, when you upload it. Um, the example on the slide here is, is toggle on to 50%. Personally, I like to use the 100% option. This will give us the largest, clearest photo. And the photos are critical for uh, practitioners and database administrators that are helping to confirm the data that you're submitting. So the better the photo, the more likely we'll be able to accurately identify the species you're reporting. So I've selected 100% on my app. Next, you have the option to save photos to your device's camera roll. So essentially, anytime you take a photo in the app, if this selection is toggled on, it will also automatically save that photo um, to your device. Otherwise, the photo is just held within the app and is then uploaded to the cloud and is not saved locally. So if you wanna keep photos on your device, you would check this box on as featured on the slide. You can also select whether you'd like to display a road or satellite map by default in your app. Um, this is really personal preference and really just depends on what you'd like to see. Note that the base map will only appear in the field if you have connectivity. If you don't have connectivity, you'll just see a white screen. You can also define your map zoom level. So by default, how, how far in is the map zoomed? Um, the higher the number, the greater the detail. The default is 12. I tend to leave my app at the default of 12. Next, you can select whether you wanna use US customary or metric measurements using the dropdown. I have selected uh, US customary to provide measurements in both feet and acres. And I'll give folks a couple of seconds if they need to catch up at this point. I apologize if you're hearing background noise as there is some construction going on outside my building. Okay, next we will um, do a couple more preferences here. So there is an option for default project. So projects are used by um, practitioners to help bundle up observations that are reported by staff or volunteers. So by registering for this training, you're automatically um, granted access to the APIP Volunteer Terrestrial Plant Survey Project. So if you pre-registered for this training and provided me with the email that you have associated with your IMAF Invasives account, I, I um, made this project available to, to you and you should see it in the dropdown. If you're not seeing that project listed in the dropdown, it means I um, was unable to find your username in IMAP Invasives uh, yesterday when I populated this list. If that's the case, if you're not seeing an option to use this project, 
just reach out to me after the training and I will be sure that you're added <clears throat> to our project. You can also choose to um, identify default organization. So if you work for a particular organization, you can add that here. So uh, for example, if you work for the Austable River Association, you may choose to add that in the drop down here, which will help associate all your records with that organization. If you're just an interested volunteer or citizen scientist, you can leave this field blank. And finally, there will be an option here at the bottom for show welcome instructions. Um, this is a, just a little pop-up that occurs every time you open the app. If you don't want to see those instructions anymore, you can uncheck this box to hide them. Once you've completed all the fields, be sure to hit save and it will, um, the app should bring you back to the home menu. And you should see this, a home page. Um, I'll pause here and ask, is anyone having um, issues that they would like assistance with? And you can um, send a note in the chat or you can unmute and ask your question. And again, if you're really, really experiencing technical issues, I will offer one-on-one -on -one assistance um, at the end of this call if you remain on the line. Okay, I'm not hearing or seeing anything, so I'm assuming folks are moving along well if they're um, interested in using the app. So from this point, all of our user settings should be configured, and we're ready to record a test observation. So I'll ask if you've made it this far to select the green Add Observation button from the top right-hand corner of your app's home screen. You should now see this um, menu. So this is the uh, list of fields that we would use to um, record an observation. So it is super important that we collect and submit a photograph. Photographs are the only way for practitioners or database administrators to confirm that your observation is correct. I cannot stress the importance of a quality photo enough. So we'll take a test photo here just for the sake of practice. So we can either um, take a photo using our camera or select an existing photo from our device's mobile um, photo library. I'll choose to take a photo using my camera by tapping that top button, at which point it should launch your device's camera. You can take a photograph, it can be of anything, it can be of your desk, of your dog, of yourself, of the wall. You can take that photo, then give you the option whether you wanna retake it or use the photo. I like mine, so I'll select I like to use photo. And then you should see that photograph appear in the top of your screen. And uh, everyone should see that. Give folks just a couple seconds, just make sure they're catching up. Again, you could also use the select photo from library if you wanted to use an existing photo that is already in your device. If you have, um, developed a custom species list, there's an option here where you can toggle that on or off. If the check mark is present, as in the example on the slide, it is using your custom list. So in that following dropdown, will only display the species that you've defined in your custom list. If, the, if that check mark is untoggled, it will display all the species available for reporting in IMAP, which is a very long list. There's a lot that we can report. So since um, if you're a new user and you didn't develop a custom list, this should be unchecked. Um, I would ask that folks um, next use the drop down to select a species. And if you access this drop down, there should be an option for fake species. So the species name is simply fake species for testing. And the species are listed alphabetically, so you should be able to scroll down until you get to the Fs and then you should see the fake species in, then in parentheses for testing. So I'll give folks um, a couple seconds just to find that. Okay, once you've just selected fake species for testing, or if we were in the field, the actual species that you've either encountered or not encountered, you would then define whether this is a presence 
or an absence record. So we can report um, both positive findings and negative. So if we did detect a species here, we would toggle species detected by tapping that and it would turn the little radio button um, blue. Or we could select species not detected um, if this is an absence record. So remember, it's just as important to uh, record absence data as presence. So if you're out there specifically looking for a species and you don't find it, um, you know, feel free to report that using the not detected feature um, um, in the app. Finally, you should see that the date is populated to today. Um, obviously, the example on the slide here is incorrect. That's from April. Um, but if you're um, using your mobile device, you should see that's automatically populated with today's date of June 9th, 2020. Again, just take a pause to uh, remind folks that photos are super, super important. And not only photos, but quality photos that are in focus and of diagnostic features that can help um, a practitioner or administrator confirm your observation. Currently, the mobile app will only allow you to record one photograph. However, you are, you are able to take multiple photos with your phone, and you can add those to your observation later on using the desktop system um, and, and accessing IMF invasives online. Okay, as we continue to scroll down through the app, we'll next see that there is a little checkbox here where it says GPS. If the checkbox is enabled, it means that the phone is automatically using your GPS coordinates, coordinates to record this observation. If you uncheck this box, you're able to pan and zoom the map to manually move the um, location of your point which is represented by that yellow um, marker in the map below. You do have the option here to change your base map from road to satellite, uh, depending on what you'd like to see. Again, if you're offline in the field, you will not see this mobile, or excuse me, this base map. You'd rather just see a, uh, a point in a kind of a white screen. But if you're connected to Wi-Fi or cellular net network right now, you should see your base map. You also have a plus and minus here. We have the option to zoom in and out. You have a, uh, you should have an indicator that represents your location, where this observation is being recorded. And below the map, you should see the lat long coordinates for your observation. If for some reason this displays as zero zero, it means that you have not enabled um, your phone to provide GPS coordinates to the app and you need to update your app permissions. So if you're seeing zero, zero here, um, that just means you need to change some app settings. Okay, so does anyone need assistance? If so, please just drop a note in the chat and we'll continue on. So next, as you scroll down, you'll see some additional options where we can populate our project and organization. If you defined a project, in your preferences, it should automatically be populated here. Or you can now use the drop down to select a project or change the project. Again, if you define an organization in your preferences, it should automatically be populated. Or you could use the drop down to select one that is available to you. And you should see an additional field here where you can indicate the amount of time that you searched for the particular species that you're looking for. Uh, and note that this is in minutes. So you can um, click this field or tap this field and enter the number of minutes that you searched for your fake species. Now, since we are actually uh, observing a plant, uh, the fake species is considered a plant, you'll likely see two additional fields on your app that are not pictured on my slide here today. There should be a drop down that is for the size of the area containing the invasive. And if you toggle this, you'll see it provides you with different options from up to 10 square feet, up to a half acre, up to one acre, or more than one acre. This is helpful information to provide um, if a practitioner like myself or our staff are viewing this report online. And it's something that we might like to go out and manage by providing an estimation of the size containing the invasive, it can help us plan how many resources or staff will be needed to control this infestation. So I'd encourage you to take your best guess at the size of the infestation. You can populate that here and then provide an ind indication of its distribution. Is it trace, 
such as a single plant or clump? Is it sparse, scattered plants or clumps? Is it dense plants or clumps? A monoculture, meaning it's only that one particular plant occupying a large area? Or is it literally scattered along a road or trail? And you can record that in the drop down. And finally, there's just an open ended option where you can record any additional comments that you think might enhance your report or assist a practitioner um, upon follow up. So I might just say that my observation is a test point. And I can enter that into the comments. And once I'm done recording all of that information, I can hit save. So Nettie mentioned that she did not see the plant options that I'm mentioning. So they're not featured on my slide. This slide is actually a little out of date. I apologize for that. But if you have selected in your species dropdown, fake species for testing as the species, at the bottom of your list, you should see two additional fields that are not pictured on the slide. The fields are called size of area containing invasive and a distribution of invasive. If you're not seeing those and you have selected fake species for testing, uh, I would encourage you to follow up with me at the end of the call and we can diagnose the issue. Once you've recorded all of your information, you can select save and your app should return you to your home page. What you should now see on your home page is a yellow rectangle that lists the species you recorded. It should list the date that it was recorded. And if you collected a photo, it should be featured on the left hand side of that yellow rectangle. There is not one pictured on my example here. So this yellow rectangle is called a, is it called a card. It represents an observation that you've recorded that is currently saved on your mobile device and is waiting to be uploaded to the, um, to the database. So you can collect as many of these cards or observation as you would like while offline in the field. And then when you return home at the end of the day, after your recreating or after your survey, we can upload these cards to the cloud or to the server using wireless internet. So if you're currently at home and you're connected to Wi-Fi, we can actually um, you know, practice uploading these to the database. You can upload them using your device's mobile data plan, but just recognize that it will consume data. And if you're uploading a lot of pictures, it can consume quite a bit of data. So to upload an observation, what we'll do is select the little checkbox on the right-hand side of this map card. You'll toggle that on and a check mark will appear. If you had multiple cards here, you would um, you know, check on as many that you, as you wanted to upload. I typically recommend that you don't try to upload a significant number at the same time. Um, I would usually upload anywhere from three to five at once. So I, kinda, I tend to do mine in batches if I have a lot of them saved. Once we've toggled on the map card that we wanna upload, We'll go back to the upper left hand corner of our app to that menu icon, which is represented by the three horizontal white bars. We'll tap the menu icon and then select upload selected. And we'll be prompt with a screen that says, are you sure you wanna upload one record? If we were uploading multiple here, it would say, you know, X number of records. If you're not connected to Wi-Fi, the app will prompt you at some point that, hey, you're going to upload this using your data plan. Do you wanna proceed? But since we're connected to Wi-Fi here, we can just hit OK. The um, app should kind of process. You see a little spinny menu icon. And if successful, you should get a window that says uploaded one record. Um, you can visit IMAP3 online to log in and view your uploaded or recorded records. So it was everyone that was able to record a um, fake species, was everyone able to upload their observation successfully? If not, um, please you know, weigh in using the comments or the chat box. Uh, and I see um, someone followed up and said that you'll only see those additional fields if you selected species detected. That's a great point. I, I'm sorry for missing that. If you selected species not detected, um, yeah, you would not see those additional fields.
So Marcus um, says he's not seeing an organizational affiliation. So you'll only see organizations in that dropdown if you're a member of that organization. Um, you have to be, you have to request access to the organization or be granted access by um, one of the organizational managers. So Marcus, if you would like to, you know, have um, an organization set up for uh, Canada Lakes, that's definitely possible and that's something that you would work on um, with the IMAP team and I can help walk you through that process. Any other issues or questions? Okay, so if you've progressed through all of those steps, you should have learned how to set your preferences in the mobile app, you learned how to record an observation, and you learned how to upload it to the IMAP Invasives database. So at this point, you have learned how to use the mobile app, and you are ready to begin collecting data in the field. So I would encourage you to um, you know, continue practicing with the app, if you'd like to go back and to find a custom species list that is helpful and can make it a little bit easier for you to record data in the field. So you can access your preferences at any time by going to the menu icon and selecting preferences. You can update those as many times and as often as you need. Just be sure to save your changes and then you're ready to go out into the field. So that is a quick tutorial to the IMAP mobile app. Uh, if we were physically together today, we would go out in the field and practice recording some real observations. Um, unfortunately, we can't do that. So I would encourage you all to explore on your own. And if you do have um, technical follow-up questions or need one-on-one -on -one assistance, you can remain on the call at this point for additional help. Um, I just see a couple other questions coming through. So someone asked, can anyone get access to the volunteer project? So there were only a handful of folks that I was able to add to that volunteer project ahead of time based on the information they provided in their uh, registration to this training. If I was un unable to find your um, email associated with IMAP in that registration form, you're not added to the volunteer project at this time but I will be sure to follow up after this training and make sure everyone has access to that volunteer project. So if you are um, experiencing issues adding the project, just please you know, ping me or reach out to me by email um, and, we'll, and I'll follow up. So as I mentioned in the beginning, I, we, I made sure to include some buffer time for our training. So this is actually the end. Um, so you can remain on the line if you have additional questions, or I thank you for joining us and um, look forward to seeing some of the observations that you collect this field season. Hey, Zach, this is Emily. Can I add something? Sure. Um, hi, all. I'm Emily. I'm the Education and Communications Coordinator for APIP, and I just put a link in the chat um, that leads you all to the resource library on our website. Um, here, you will be able to find a couple of brochures that APIP has been using for um, a long while now that are pretty well liked in the Adirondacks for identifying invasive plants in the region, as well as animals um, and a few different landowner guides. We are working on, so you'll be able to um, freely access those from this link. Um, and we're working this uh, summer cool. to put together new um, refreshed documents and brochures and potentially yeah. even a field guide going so, forward. Uh, um, I'm gonna mute this person if I can find them. Um, so please let us know if there's anything, this is actually a new website design. So if there's something, that maybe you had been using or finding on our website, okay. um, even as recently off. as last week. Um, and you don't see it here, please just let us know because it's a work in progress. Um, and there's actually, so there's a number, and Zach mentioned at the very top of the discussion that there's a number of different, uh, I'm putting it in the chat right now, there's a number of different trainings about species, about 
anything from murder hornets to deeper dives into IMAP invasive training um, going on throughout the state, all on a digital platform in order to abide by social distancing um, regulations and safety protocols. So if you go to NY I saw.org slash event. Oh, I'm sorry, that's events with an, an S. I'll put it in again. You'll find a lot more happenings. Um, and if you go to our own events page, I've plugged those all in there as well. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to explore all from the safety of home this, this week. Um, so that's what I wanted to add. Thanks, Emily. Um, and again, if folks need more uh, technical assistance, feel free to remain on the line. Otherwise, we thank you for joining us today.